I can tell you that uh, when Ashley, when I first met Ashley, and she knows the crowd that works on our ranch, all guide in the women's antelope hunt, which is a phenomenal success and has been for the last several years. And when they all met Ashley, they were just completely wowed. Of course, it was partly the chair with the tracks and everything else. But when she started uh, just giving her charisma and her wonderful message of, you know, taking adversity in stride, um, Ashley, uh, you, you have just made a difference in you just everybody's life that you've touched. And, uh, you know, to, to see you here and to know that you've been in the residence here a couple of times with the, lady, the First Lady's uh, Hunger Initiative and the key role you played in Food from the Field, the, the new effort that, that, that the, we, we have where hunters can donate meat that goes to feed the hungry. Um, and, and I know uh, Aaron is, uh, you, you know, Aaron, if I remember correctly, Aaron, you hadn't hunted before last year, and now it's like you have 7,000 licenses, you're going everywhere, um, and, and, and that's the kind of infection uh, that, that Ashley brings in a good way to, uh, I'm speaking about infections, Ashley, <laughs> but, but um, Ashley's uh, backstory, I think you'll probably hear a little bit about, but just the fact of, of, of having a, a broken back uh, and, and, and then the circumstances and just rising to that challenge in a way that nobody, nobody even sees uh, any, any kind of difference in, in your ability to get things done. Um, and so Ashley, it, it is really an honor for me to, to say, uh, here, here's your keynote speaker. Thank you, Governor. That's probably the best introduction I've ever had. I hope we recorded it and I'll just use that one over and over. And <laughs> Thank you for that. Get my PowerPoint here going. Well, I've so never Ashley, been to- I would, Ashley, I would say that Al Simpson's favorite thing is of all the introductions I've ever gotten, that was the most recent. <laughs> That's very true, I agree. <laughs> Well, I'm so grateful to be here with all of you tonight for Christie's birthday party. I think it's a, it's a great turnout for that. <laughs> but I've never been so probably thankful and so frustrated by technology as I have in 2020. But I'm very glad that it's given us all the opportunity to be together when we usually wouldn't be able to. And so grateful for that at this time. But to say that 2020 has been a difficult year, to say it's been an interesting year, a year of teaching us all to adapt, I think would be quite an understatement. Um, as, a year, as this year kind of nears its end, I can't help but look back over the past several months and really see a parallel to the last 21 years of my life. Um, I guess you could say that I've kind of had a 2020 kind of life. Um, with um, all the interesting surprises and adaptions that I've had to make. But fortunately for me, what some people might see as a difficult journey has really just been a beautiful experience to learn so many important lessons along the way. And so as we say good riddance to 2020, um, I hope that we can all look back over this journey that we've been on together here in Wyoming and across the country and really just remember the lessons that we've learned. But my um, journey to learning how to adapt actually didn't start in January and it didn't start in February and it didn't start in March like so many of yours did. It really started um, several decades ago here in Cody. And that's the journey that I'd like to share with you guys in the time that we have remaining this evening. Um, I actually grew up right outside of Indianapolis and I was a good Hoosier girl. And what that meant was that I hit about six foot two in the seventh grade. And so I was taller than all the boys. I'm number 44 there in the picture you can see. And I wasn't very coordinated, but my coaches would just say, just stand under the basket and hold your arms up in the air, you'll be fine. And so being six foot two um, came in really handy for athletics. I went from volleyball to basketball to fast pitch softball to slow pitch softball, and then I'd start all over again. And so athletics was really just my entire life. And I was really upset with my parents when one summer they decided that I was going to have to take time out of sports to load everyone in the family minivan and drive all the way across the country from Indiana to Wyoming. And they wanted to do this road trip with us like a lot of crazy parents do. 
and we hit Waldrug and the Corn Palace and uh, Mount Rushmore and through the Badlands and all of the amazing places that people like to go when they travel cross country. But I will never forget when we crossed over for the first time into Wyoming. And I saw the mountains and I saw the animals and all the outdoor adventures and the cute cowboys. And I thought, you know what? Wyoming will always be something special to me. And I didn't realize at the time what that would mean, but was given the opportunity the next year to actually go back out to Wyoming to a youth camp. Now, what I didn't know at the time was that in Wyoming, youth camp is actually code for free child labor. And so we got to go to a working ranch and really just experience everything it had to offer. A lot of the people didn't necessarily like it. And I really just loved every second of it. We got to learn how to take care of the animals. We got to learn about baling hay and staining fences and cutting firewood. And I just thought it was the best thing ever. But little did I know really what was in store for me at the end of that camp. And so the first two weeks, they worked us pretty well. And we got to spend a lot of time getting to know what it was like to really live on a working ranch. But we were building up to a big backpack trip. And that was kind of going to be the big um, kind of reward that we received for working so hard those first two weeks. And so on Monday morning, August 2nd in 1999, I remember waking up really early knowing that I had to get a lot of chores done before we left for the backpack trip. And so I traveled down to the lower corrals where we were and where we had some animals and I, I bypassed all the horses and I headed back to the back corrals where we kept a lot of the steers that we'd had there on the ranch. And I climbed onto a hay rack, which is just kind of a big log table that um, keeps the hay off the ground so the animals don't get to it. And I reached into the back of my brand new Wranglers and I pulled out my pocket knife and I cut the twine on the bale of hay and started to pitch that down to the animals below with the pitchfork that I had. And one of the flakes out of that bale fell off to the side. And when that happened, I leaned over to get that flake of hay and in the process lost my balance and started to fall. And the last thing I remember thinking was throw the pitchfork. Um, I hit my head on the way down and so I knocked myself out, came to a little while later. And the first thing I thought was um, that my legs felt really funny. I don't know if you've ever hit your elbow and your arm kind of tingles and goes numb, but that's kind of what my legs felt like. And so I thought maybe a bale of hay had fallen on me or one of the cows had gotten out and it was on me somehow. And that's when I saw the pitchfork. Unfortunately, what had happened was it had landed and then I had landed crossways on the wooden handle. So I started to yell for help. I knew immediately that something was wrong. And the camp director's wife came out onto her front porch about that time with her morning coffee. And she heard me calling for help. And so she came down there to the corrals and found me. Um, the ambulance from um, the Cody hospital came and got me and took me back to Cody and then took me by helicopter up to Billings, Montana. Now, those of you that are parents, if you can imagine getting that phone call, my parents were all the way back in Indiana when this happened. And so they had to approve my first surgery over the phone. They had to try to get the first flight out they could on that Monday and actually didn't get out until late that evening into Billings. And I don't remember a whole lot about the first couple days. I was on a lot of pain medication, had several surgeries. But what I do remember is the doctors coming in on a Friday morning and telling me that they had done everything that they could, but that I would never walk again. And to, to sit there at 16 years old and realize that I had all these plans and all these dreams and not one of them involved living the rest of my life in a wheelchair really put me into what I say kind of as an understatement is a little bit of a dark time in my young life. I mean, it took quite a while for me to understand that my life wasn't over, that my life was still worth living and that I still, even in a wheelchair, could accomplish great things. And while that didn't happen overnight, the biggest um, thing that I took out of it was through the support of my family and my friends and the faith that I, I hold so important to my life that things do happen for a reason, I found that, you know what, everyone has that pitchfork moment. Obviously, mine actually involved the pitchfork, but everyone has that one defining moment in their life where they have to ask themselves, am I going to let this run everything or am I going to take what some people may see as a difficult thing or a tragedy and really turn it around and not only grow myself, but use it to help other people. And so it was quite the process, but learning lessons along the way has always been something that's really important to me. And so that's really what I wanted to share with you folks this evening are the lessons that I learned over the last 21 years. And the first is how important it is sometimes to redefine your life. Now, looking back to being 16 years old, 
I thought I had my whole life planned out ahead of me. I knew exactly what I wanted to do with my life. I knew exactly um, where I was going to college, what job I would have, what that was all going to look like. And like I said before, none of that involved having a disability. And so I went from being the, the tall girl that loved sports and loved the outdoors to suddenly finding myself as someone who was now four foot four and living life in a wheelchair. And so I thought, wow, you know, I, I just need to prove to everyone that I can still do what I had always planned to do, regardless of my disability. And what I found is that sometimes it takes more courage to let go of your old dreams that you don't even recognize anymore in order to move on to new dreams. And some people will see that as failure in your life. But if you're the person that makes that decision for yourself, it's not failure. It takes more courage and more bravery to do that. And so I thought to myself, you know, I'd always wanted to, to be an orthopedic surgeon. And because of a lot of different things physically, I saw that wasn't going to work anymore. And so I started to look at my life and say, okay, if you're going to adapt and you're going to redefine your life, what can you do to take this accident and this disability that you'll now learn to live with and really use it to help others? And so that's what I did. I, I went and got a master's degree in counseling. I started to work on advocacy work and, and really just find a lot of fulfillment in taking what had been bad in my life and turning it into good in the lives of others. And I just kept been giving these amazing opportunities to, to work with other people and to really be there for others in a way that I had never had when my accident happened. And so I was so incredibly thankful that early on, I learned the lesson that as hard as it is, sometimes you have to redefine your life. And sometimes when you do that, the best is yet to come and you didn't even realize it was going to be there. But as I started to learn to redefine my life, um, I also started to learn about the importance of being brave. Now, that's something that's very easy to say. A lot of folks would, would think of people in Wyoming as people that are very brave. But sometimes I find that bravery sometimes is harder in the small moments. And they always say you can draw a circle around yourself. And that's where your comfort zone is. But all the adventure happens outside of that circle. And so I started to ask myself, you know, what are some things that you, you've always wanted to do, but maybe you think that your disability is preventing you from doing? And I started thinking about relationships. And I started thinking about having a family one day and being outdoors and being active. And just happened to meet a boy um, visiting back out here in Wyoming. And they always say, you know, things like that kind of kind of change your life for the good. And so when I met this boy, I thought, okay, great. Met the man of my dreams. He just happens to live in the place of my dreams. But what if Wyoming is now not accessible to me anymore? And I thought, you know what? I, I just have to take a chance and I have to pursue a dream and be brave enough to get outside my comfort zone. And so learning to um, open myself back up again to someone else after my accident, learning to find my confidence again, learning to find my self-worth and that I didn't need to settle because of my disability was such an important journey for me. Um, but it took a lot of bravery to put myself out there. And then once Russ and I, my husband, were married and we moved back out um, here to Wyoming, we started talking about having kids. And I don't know about you guys, but I didn't know a lot of people with disabilities. And I just assumed, you know, maybe we couldn't have kids. Maybe we weren't allowed to have kids. I was like, you know, what if I have a baby and I I drop it and I roll over it? Or what if I have a kid and it gets behind the couch and I can't get to it or something like that? And I don't want to be the mom in the wheelchair that embarrasses their kids all the time. And so we started talking to different doctors and things like that and ended up being incredibly blessed in 2010 to have our little daughter born. And I did drop her and roll over her multiple times. She survived just fine. She did get behind the couch a couple of times. You poke them with a broom, they come back out. And I, you know what, I also learned that all parents embarrass their kids, whether they have a disability or not. And so my daughter is just an amazing, amazing blessing in our lives that we never would have experienced had we not been brave enough to get outside our comfort zone and do something that some other people thought was impossible. And you know, me having a disability has actually made her a pretty amazing little person. Um, she's never known any different. And so other little kids will come up to my daughter and say, you know, what's wrong with your mom? And She'll say nothing. What's wrong with your mom? And they're like, well, I don't know. They run back to their parents. They're like, mom, what's wrong with you? Why don't you have a wheelchair? You know? And so it kind of gets turned around at times because like I said, this is normal to her. So raising a little girl that, that doesn't see differences in people that thinks that everyone is, is worth getting to know that climbs the shelves at Walmart, like nobody's business. She's just an amazing little person. 
And again, something that we probably would have missed out on had we not been brave enough to get outside that comfort zone and try something that was that was uncomfortable at the time. And then I start thinking about um, all of my outdoor adventures. Now, growing up in Indiana, I did not, um, I was not a hunter, did not know any hunters. I was very sure that when I moved out to Wyoming, I would have nothing to do with hunting. Um, I married a man who was um, very much a shooter and a hunter, but I thought to myself, no, I love animals. I can't do that. And so my husband would challenge me and say, well, don't you eat meat? And I thought, yes, I do. I get it at Walmart. And he would always kind of look at me like, okay, you're very disconnected from your food. But I thought, you know, no, that animal, the, the food there is, is just fine. Those animals, you know, die in retirement communities surrounded by family and friends. It's a very beautiful experience. And that's where I get my meat. And he would just shake his head at me and just tell me over and over how disconnected I was from, from my food and being self-sufficient. And so back in 2008, I was actually given the opportunity to help form a group here in Cody called Wyoming Disabled Hunters. And I thought, yes, this is great. I will be the secretary. I will take notes and I will keep all the guys in line during the meetings. And what I did not know was that this group was going to be working with people with disabilities from across the country, bringing them to Wyoming to hunt and that they needed a token girl. And so of course it looks so much better for diversity on all your brochures if everyone with a disability is smiling and there's at least one female in the picture. And so I was given a borrowed crossbow two days before my first hunt and told that I needed to get out there and I just did not think I could make it happen. And the only way I know how to describe it is that first hunt that I went on, um, a deer stepped out from the blind and this primal urge came over me and I thought to myself, that is my deer. And it's what my husband says has just really created a monster. He spent the last how many years now chasing me all over, not only the world, but all over the country, not only the country, but all over the world getting to go on these amazing hunting experiences. And it's become such a part of my life now that I really don't understand how it ever wasn't. And I found so much healing in the outdoors and I've seen other people find so much healing in the outdoors. And so I'm so thankful that I was encouraged to be brave enough to try something that I never in a million years ever would have tried before. Um, but now I can say I'm probably more active as a person with a disability than I ever was as a person that was able-bodied. And again, it's just it just kind of is one of those things I chalk up to being encouraged to be brave and to try things that a lot of people probably wouldn't have tried before, but experiences that I know that I will cherish for a lifetime and that I can look back now on and think, you know, now I get to share that with other people and it's been so encouraging. But the last lesson I wanted to talk about tonight, and I'll try to be brief with this, and it's something that I've really had to learn over the years um, through living life with a disability, and that's how important it is to laugh. Now, some of us can look back over 2020 and probably think that there's not a lot to laugh about. And I'm not the type of person that thinks that every opportunity that you have is, you know, that you go through is a good opportunity to laugh. I understand sometimes things are serious, but I think one of the biggest things that I've learned over the past 21 years is that sometimes you kind of have to laugh to keep from crying. Sometimes you have to laugh to break the ice with other people. Sometimes you have to laugh to just show other people that they are able to be comfortable around you and what you're experiencing. And so I've always appreciated this um, quote from Charlie Chaplin. It says, to truly laugh, you must be able to take your pain and play with it. And I kind of feel like that's what's happened to me over the last 21 years. My mother would say I've developed a very twisted sense of humor, um, but I think that it's, it's kind of a way that I'm able to make other people comfortable and break the ice with other people and really show them that I love my life. And other people can look at my life and my disability and maybe think that it's difficult or it's a tragedy, but I would not change a thing. And I can seriously look back and say that every good thing in my life over the past 21 years has been a direct result of my, of my accident happening. And so being able to stay positive and make that choice every morning and laugh and, and really just enjoy my life has been such a blessing. But back in the spring, as Christy mentioned, when some of us had to go from sending our kids off to school every day to homeschooling, um, a bunch of the moms in my daughter's school got together and we started sending each other memes back and forth. And I'm sure so many of you have seen all the memes of 2020 and how great they've all been. So I thought I'd close tonight by sharing just a couple of them that I've really enjoyed. Um, and some of these you may have already seen, so laugh quietly to yourself if you have. But these have been put together over the last nine or 10 months and I'm gonna make a coffee table book and give it to everybody for Christmas, I think, because the memes of 2020 have been so great. But 
to Christy and all of our other introverts out there. It says, you never realize how antisocial you are until there's a pandemic and your life doesn't really change that much. <laughs> Some of us, like Christy said about the social distancing, I always tell people we've been doing that in Wyoming since 1890. So I don't really understand what the big deal is, but it's kind of been nice for those of us that are introverts. Oh, the wine that's been consumed, especially for those of us homeschooling our children. It says, it's just that I find that having two glasses of wine at once stops me from touching my face. So you gotta do what you gotta do to maintain those guidelines there. And then finally, it says the World Health Organization has, not, has announced that dogs cannot contract COVID-19. <laughs> dogs previously held in quarantine can now be released. To be clear, who let the dogs out? So <laughs> just fun little quotes along the way that people have sent where we can all look back over 2020 and maybe smile a little bit and laugh a little bit. Sometimes, like I said, to keep from crying, but we have to be able to choose positivity and to have a good attitude about things. And People are drawn to that and they're going to, to want to affect that same behavior when they see you doing it as well. So as we stay good riddance to 2020, we can certainly look back and say, yep, it's been difficult, but guess what? 2019 had some difficult moments. Many years before 2020 had difficult moments and this is not going to stop on December 31st of this year. 2021 could possibly bring some difficult moments for us as well. So it's not really about avoiding the difficult times that defines us. It's really about the lessons that we learn through those difficult times. So what lessons have you learned this year? What have you been given the opportunity to learn about? Maybe you've been given an, an opportunity to redefine your life. Have you been brave enough to take that? Have you been brave enough to step outside your comfort zone and pursue new adventures, whether you wanted them to happen in 2020 or not? Maybe you just need to take a deep breath in order to allow yourself to laugh a little. So however you've chosen to deal with 2020, and we've all done that differently, please do not waste this experience. Learn from it, grow from it, lead through it, but whatever you do, let it change you in the best way possible and learn as many lessons as you can along the way. Thank you. Thanks for sharing so much of your journey and inspiring all of us to take a look at how we process this experience and what it looks like and for the laughs too. Appreciate that.